Love you all. Love you back. Now, would you be so kind as to double up that shout for the one who gave his all for us, Jesus! Hallelujah! Let the Lord and be glorified tonight. It's all about you, Lord. Hallelujah. He's the one altogether lovely, amen? amen. You know, when Jesus is tough, he doesn't hurt. Amen. When he is kind, he's not soft. Amen. He's steel and velvet. Amen. Servant and king. Amen. He's altogether lovely. Give him praise. <laughs> love you, Lord. You may be seated. <laughs> love you back. I want to introduce the one that loves me all the time. <laughs> when I'm good and when I'm bad. <laughs> Sometimes when I'm bad, I'm kind of good. <laughs> She's blessed. <laughs> My lovely wife is here, Wendy. <laughs> My beautiful daughter, Jessica. You know, it's a real honor and privilege for me to be here. I don't say that lightly because I know there is no lack of great ministers of the word in America. So for Joel and Victoria to invite me is no small thing to me. I honor that. I take the sense of humility and responsibility. I'll make sure I do good. You know, Joel and I, we share a lot of similarities. We have ministries of grace and hope. We have beautiful wives. <laughs> Lovely daughters. He has a, a handsome boy. And the doctors tell us that 70% my next child might be a boy. <laughs> but the most striking similarity between us both is that we are both darn good looking. <laughs> At least we think so. So much for humility. Are you all ready for the word? <laughs> Hold up, okay, never mind. John chapter one, verse 17, my favorite scripture verse. John chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given. You can give from a distance. I could send a DVD of myself from Singapore, but I came. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through a servant. Grace came through the Son. The law talks about what men ought to be. Grace reveals who God is. In the first miracle of Moses, he turned the water into blood, resulting in death. In the first miracle of grace, Jesus turned the water into wine, resulting in life and celebration. Under law, God demands righteousness from sinfully bankrupt men. But under grace, God provides righteousness as a gift. Amen. Now, which one do you want to be under? I thought you would. And yet today we are so confused, we mixed up law and grace, we have some law and some grace. Jesus said you cannot put new wine, grace, into the old wine skin because the new wine would ferment and you will lose both. Now, under law, God said, 
I'll by no means pass by your transgressions, but I'll visit your sins to the third and fourth generation. But under grace, God says, I will be merciful to your unrighteousness, and your sins I will remember no more. That's been a change. That's been a change, church. And it's all because of Jesus. And yet, we are still preaching the law. We are still preaching, if you obey God, God will bless you. If you disobey God, God will curse you. Now, it sounds so right, but it's so dangerous because today, many of us, we don't have it all together, but we are so blessed. I mean, Joy and I will testify to that. It is called unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. Amen. You know, when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he said, love your enemies. We've got problems loving our neighbor, Amen. let alone our enemies. He said, if your right eye offend you, pluck it out, throw it away from you. If your hand offend you, cut it off. Have you seen any, any church, anyone doing that? <laughs> the church will look like a huge amputation ward. <laughs> so what did Jesus mean? Jesus brought the law to its pristine standard where the Pharisees has brought the law in a way that's manageable. Jesus says, if you give the woman the eye, you have sin. The Pharisee says, unless you do it physically, you have sin. So Jesus is an expert at using the law to bring you to the end of yourself so that you'll see your need for Jesus. Amen. He didn't mean for you to pluck out your eye and cut off your hand. Well, Pastor Prince, you should have come earlier. <laughs> Clap your stops all together. <laughs> At least you still got your eyeball. <laughs> so what, what did Jesus mean? Now, if Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount and he stayed up there on the Mount, there'll be no hope for us. But you know the king of the Sermon on the Mount, the king came down the mountain. He came down to where there was sighing, crying, dying humanity. And somehow there was a leper that made his way by stealth in the midst of the crowd. And Jesus found that leper and he said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. There's no way the standards of the Sermon on the Mount could save him. Jesus came down to where we were. And Jesus touched him. He's not been touched all these years. He's not embraced his children. He cannot even be in a public place for a leper is someone unclean. And when he's in a public place, he must shout, unclean, unclean! And here he is before Jesus. And he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He didn't doubt Jesus could. He doubted he would. And Jesus stretched out his hand and says, I am willing. Be cleansed. Now watch this. Under law, the leper the unclean will make the clean unclean. But under grace, Jesus made the unclean clean. Yeah. Under law, sin is contagious. Under grace, righteousness and God's goodness is contagious. Yeah. We need not fear that being under grace will cause licent licentiousness. Because the Bible says clearly in Romans 6, 14, if you look up here, for sin shall not have dominion over you for or because you are not under law, but under grace. But what we have believed is that when you are under grace, sin will have dominion over you. We've been hoodwinked by the devil. The, the word of God is so clear. When you are under grace and not under law, sin shall not have dominion over you. The word sin there is a noun. You can put Satan shall not have dominion over you. Sickness shall not have dominion over you. Poverty shall not have dominion over you. When? When you are not under law, but under grace. This idea that when people are under grace, it will cause licentiousness is from the pit of hell. You cannot be under water and not be wet any more than you can be under grace and not be holy. You see, 
Joel's ministry, he preaches people right into the grace of God. You never knew you got slapped right into the grace of God with God's goodness. That smile is dangerous to the devil. And then there's always some people who will say, well, Pastor Prince, you need to preach more on repentance. He tells Joel, Joel, you need to preach more on repentance. But you know something? Under law, you have to repent first before God can bless you. But under grace, God blesses you first. And if you receive the blessing and His goodness, the goodness of God will lead you to repentance. That's been a change. So why not we just open up the people's hearts and let them receive God's goodness anyway? When they receive God's goodness, they will change. Not because of their willpower, but because of His goodness. Amen? You know, every Sunday from this pulpit, repentance is going on in the church. Because as Joel preaches, the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. Changing of minds is taking place all the time. All the time. Repentance is not beating your breast, shouting, Jesus, Jesus, in the altar call. You understand? You can do all that and go away and change. Because you have not, not heard something that will change your life. But every time you hear the word of God, you hear the good news. You hear how, how wonderful God is and his plans towards you are plans of good and not evil. How God is for you, your minds begin to change. Because the natural man, they have hard thoughts about God. Their thoughts about God are legalistic and hard. You see, Joel's preaching is dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. So is my preaching. Amen. Amen. God is raising ministers of righteousness in these last days. In the past, the church has had many ministers and we have great revivals, no doubt, no doubt, all right? And those revivals have been characterized by preaching against sin, and they are revivals nonetheless. I'm not saying that people are not saved, I'm not saying they were not revivals, but if you look at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 9, it tells us up here, look up here, it says, the ministry, if the ministry of condemnation had glory, God calls those ministry, ministry of condemnation, those revivals that emphasize sin, preaching against sin, God calls them ministry of condemnation. And God said they were glorious. But look, watch this. The ministry of righteousness exceeds, exceeds much more in glory. You ain't seen nothing yet. God is raising ministers of righteousness all over the world. There is a grace revolution on. And we are so glad we are part of it. Amen. Gone are those days of ministries of condemnation. It's ministry of righteousness. You know, I remember many years ago in my living room, God spoke to me while I was doing my study. I was sitting on the floor and with all my Bibles and my study aids, and God spoke to me very clearly on the inside. He said, son, study the journey of the children of Israel from Egypt to Mount Sinai, for this is a picture of pure grace. Although they murmured and complained during this time, not a single one died. Now, I've never heard anyone preach this at a time. I've never read any books on it. So I feverishly went to my Bible, checked that portion as if to prove God wrong. <laughs> Have you done that before? <laughs> you can never win God. And I found not a single one died from Egypt to Sinai. Although they murmured, they complained. Now, how many know murmuring and complaining is sin? All right? Be before the Red Sea, when the armies of Pharaoh were charging against them from behind and the Red Sea was in front of them, they shouted, Moses, did you bring us out here to die? Are there not enough graves in Egypt? They murmured and complained. No one died. God opened up the sea. Next three days, they were doing okay, and then there was no water. They complained, and God made the bitter waters sweet. They were okay for a few days, and then they complained there was no food, and God rained, not judgment, but bread from heaven. It seems like every fresh murmuring brought forth fresh demonstrations of God's goodness. 
They complained again, there was no water and God brought forth water out of the flinty rock. And then they came to the foot of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. And then they said to God, all that the Lord has said, we will do. Now in the Hebrew, is a strong word, which means all that God can command us, <laughs> we can do it. Even before they heard the Ten Commandments in chapter 20, they boasted even before they have heard. Now that is man presuming on his own strength, on his own righteousness, which he had none. And all this while, God has blessed them, not because they are good, but because he is good. He has made a way and provided for them, not because of their faithfulness, but because of his faithfulness. They came out by the Abrahamic covenant of grace. And now at the foot of the mountain, in essence, they are saying to God, God, don't treat us, don't judge us, don't assess us based, don't bless us based on your goodness, bless us based on our obedience. The moment man presume on his own strength, notice God changed his stone in Exodus 19. God said, Moses, tell them, don't come near. All of a sudden, God puts a distance between him and man. If you want me to bless you based on your obedience, based on your goodness, then don't come near. The mountain is holy, lest you die. Now, he never had that tone before, before this. He was in the pillar of cloud by day, in the pillar of fire by night. He was close to them. And yet, all of a sudden, because man presumed on his holiness, on his own righteousness, which he had none, God says, this is the deal. If you want me to bless you based on your obedience, don't come near. Not even a beast can come near, lest it dies. In the next chapter, God gives them the big ten. And listen, God did not say, if you break one, you are guilty of the one you break. God says, if you break one, you are guilty of all. In other words, if you don't commit adultery, but you steal, God sees you as an adulterer. That's what it means. In other words, the Ten Commandments stands as a composite whole. And you know what happened after that? Right after Sinai, when they murmured and complained, the same sin they committed before Sinai, you know what happened? They died. When they complain, they die. When they complain, they die. That tells us they should never have exchanged covenants. And God put Israel for 1,500 years, God put Israel under the law. And the best of them failed. Even David failed. See, the law condemns the best of us. Grace saves the worst of us. <laughs> Hallelujah for his amazing grace. The scriptures are clear that the ministry of death, if you look up here in 2 Corinthians 3, it tells you clearly, clearly in verse seven, if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones, notice ministry of death, God calls the 10 commandments the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones. Now you can't tell me, Pastor Prince, we are not under law in the sense, we are not under killing of sacrificial animals. We are not under the feast of Israel because those laws were never engraved on stones. The ministry of death God is talking about are the only ones engraved on stones. And what are they? The Ten Commandments. God calls it the ministry of death. And sometimes we have a series of Sunday meetings where we teach the Ten Commandments, killing people softly <laughs> every single week. God calls it the ministry of death. Look at the verse before this. God has made us ministers, sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. Now, if you want to be a minister of the old covenant, there's no power, there's no sufficiency there. There's no provision, there is no favor, there's no charisma and no charismata. All right, God only makes sufficient those who are ministers of the new covenant. And it tells us clearly, not of the letter but of the spirit, for the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Do you know that the first Pentecost 50 days after Passover, the first Passover was the children of Israel with the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. That was the first Passover. 50 days after that, they were at the foot of Mount Sinai. And what did God give? God gave the law and 3,000 people died in the new covenant. 
when the day of Pentecost was fully come. God gave not the law, but the Spirit on Mount Zion, and 3,000 were saved. The latter kills, but grace, the Spirit gives life. Hallelujah! Let's move our pulpits from Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. We're on the wrong mountain. God has moved mountains. And we are still camp at Mount Sinai. No wonder we are being shaken. Because those that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, the new covenant. You shall not be shaken forever. Don't misunderstand me. The law is holy. The law is righteous. But it cannot make you righteous. The law is unbending. Therein lies its problem. It is like a mirror. When you look at a mirror, it is unbendingly and inflexibly true. If you see ugly, <laughs> which I never do, <laughs> if you see ugly, don't blame the mirror. <laughs> don't break the mirror, don't punch the mirror. Sometimes you look at it, it breaks. <laughs> The law just reveals who you are, but it has no power to cleanse away your blemishes. The law is holy, but it cannot make you holy. If the law bends slightly, it's no more the law. You see, the deal is this, if you can keep God's law, God will bless you, yes, but by the same token, if you break one, God has to curse you. Can you understand that? Sometimes we, we think that by preaching the law, people become lawful. But the Bible says clearly the strength of sin is the law. You hardly hear that preached in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 56. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. Wow. The word strength there is dunamis in the Greek. The strength of sin is the law. Guess what? Who is trying to bring the strength of sin back to the church? And he uses the pulpit. And no marvel because his ministers are transformed into ministers of righteousness. Righteousness according to works. His name in Hebrew is Hasatan, which means prosecutor at law. The devil, long before he can steal, kill, or destroy, He's the accuser. You must receive his accusation before he can steal from you. You must receive his accusation before he can kill, before he can destroy. He's not called the destroyer. He's called the accuser. accuser. Not the murderer, but the accuser of our brethren. You need to know his devices. In Colossians chapter 2, it tells us, Jesus nailed the handwriting of ordinances to his cross. Now, what is the handwriting of ordinances? Someone says, no one can obliterate God's handwriting. Yeah, but God can. God nailed the law to the cross. You know what's the next verse? Having disarmed principalities and powers. That tells you the armory, the weapon of the devil is the law. The devil uses the law to knock you on the head. He tells you, you have not done this enough, you have not done that enough. Even when you do right, it's not enough. When you do wrong, he tells you you have done wrong. When you do right, he tells you it's not enough. He's the accuser. The accuser. Pastor Prince, I'm married to one. No, that's not. That's your wife's <laughs> voice of conscience speaking to you, brother. You heard about the guy who boasted to his friends. You know, last night I had my wife begging, begging me on her knees. His friends were, you know... So odd by then, I say, what did she say, what did she say? Come out from under the bed and fight like a man. <laughs> no, it didn't happen to me, okay? Peace. There was a minister at a cemetery once, and he heard someone crying. 
So he made his way over to the place where he heard the crying, and there was this man hugging the tombstone, crying, why did you leave me? Why did you leave me? The, the pastor went to him and said, can I pray for you? And he says, yeah, who is that that passed away? My wife's first husband. <laughs> All right, let's get back to what you're sharing here. We are so afraid when people are not under law, they become lawless. That's the fleshly fear the devil puts in the hearts and the minds of the people. The devil tells you, without the law, you become lawless. But how come God called Abraham his friend? Abraham lived more than 400 years before the Ten Commandments was given. And he was tight with God, man. He was called my friend. God calls him my friend. I'm a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. <laughs> I'm you like that move? Slow motion. <laughs> you and I must make a pledge. We must bring salvation back. Just call his name. He'll be there. <laughs> I believe he's in heaven. Well, you know that, Pastor Prince. Now, I'm not a universalist, but I tell you this. There'll be more people saved than you reckon. All right, because of God's mercy. God says, believe on the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved and your house. You'll never know between that stage of unconsciousness and the place where one departs, God can just visit someone and say, yo, I'm Jesus. Because my Bible tells me that John saw in the book of Revelation a multitude no man could number of every tongue, of every nation, of every tribe, which no man could number. But nothing is said of that in terms of those who go to hell. It seems like there are more going to heaven. Whoa, hallelujah! And I think this church, this ministry has a lot to do with that. Unveiling the goodness of God, amen? When Peter first met Jesus, Jesus said, let's go fishing, all right? And Peter caught, the whole night he caught nothing. And he said to the Lord, at your word, I'll let down the net. Carpenter, fisherman. <laughs> well, if you say so, I'll let down the net. He let down one net. And his net broke. It was a boat sinking load of fishes. And then he realized who Jesus was. He fell at Jesus' feet and says, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Now question, which one came first? The goodness of God or Peter's repentance? Is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. So ministries like Joel, God's so good. <laughs> it's powerful. A soft tongue breaks bones. Oh man, UFC. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. I forgot I was in Lakewood. You know, Luke 18 and 19, the Holy Spirit put these two scriptures together, Luke 18 and 19. I don't believe these two events happen chronologically, but the Holy Spirit put them together in divine order. In Luke 18 is the rich young ruler. In Luke 19 is Zacchaeus. In Luke 18, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, what must I do? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? He was emphasizing his doing. Now, Jesus should have given the evangelical answer, believe on me and you shall be saved. But he did not. What did Jesus give him? The law. Honor your father and mother, thou shalt not steal, don't commit adultery. And you know what the young man did? He was quite smart, he says, all these I've kept. Whenever you boast in the law, Jesus always comes back to you and say, one thing you lack. <laughs> because by the law is the knowledge of sin. God never gave the law to justify man by. 
God gave the law so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. So that all will see their need for grace. <laughs> Jesus said, one thing you lack, sell all that you have and give to the poor and come and follow me. That's the first commandment. You must have no other gods, not even mammon, not even money. The Bible tells us that young men went away sorrowful. Next chapter, Zacchaeus. Jesus came into Jericho, and the Bible tells us Zacchaeus was short, so he climbed a tree, for all have seen and come short of the glory of God. <laughs> and the answer is always the tree. So he looked down, and Jesus looked up, and Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down, I must eat at your house. Wow. And all the people started whispering because Zacchaeus was a tax collector. That's like betraying your own nation. And the scandal of grace began. <laughs> He's gone to eat with someone who's a sinner. He's gone on this TV show. He's gone on that TV show. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. He's gone to Zacchaeus' house. <laughs> no loss given. Just grace. At the end of that meal, Zacchaeus stood up and said, you know, all that I've cheated, I'll repay fourfold. Half of my goods I give to the poor. Jesus smiled and said, salvation has come to this house. <laughs> now, watch this. In Luke 18, Jesus gave the rich young ruler the law, and he could hardly give up a dollar. Under grace, Jesus gave no laws but grace, and his wallet was open, his house was open, everything about Zacchaeus was open. You know, I always say, I gotta watch it. When my wife comes under grace, she gives everything away. I'm afraid that one of these days she will give me away. <laughs> grace makes you generous. Grace opens up your heart. And some leaders and some pastors are so afraid of grace because if I preach grace, the people will stop giving. Nothing could be further from the truth. They will give and give for all the right reasons. <laughs> Not out of fear of the curse, but the gift, because the grace of God is upon them in abundance. Amen. You know, we have added to the gospel, folks. It's sad, Jesus Christ died on the cross to give us the gift of righteousness. He became our sin that we might become His righteousness. He was cursed that we might be blessed. He was made poor at the cross that we might be rich. He wore the crown of thorns so that we can have the crown of peace. And yet we've added to the gospel. It's always Jesus plus something. Jesus plus restitution. You have that teaching here? Not here in this church. This is a grace church. I'm talking about in America. Restitution. It's not enough to be saved. You must repay back everything that you've taken. If you're a thief, you must restore everything you have stolen. It's virtually impossible. Can you imagine the thief at the cross when Jesus was nailed there? And the thief turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, I would save you if only you will make restitution. <laughs> the thief says, I would, Lord, but I'm kind of stuck. No, that wasn't the way it works. He said, Lord, remember me. Today, you shall be with me in paradise. Hallelujah. He's made it easy, folks. Praise to his dearest name, his wonderful name. Hallelujah. This is our God. This is our King. He came a long way for us. He came a long way for us. Jesus is amazing. You know, we tend to get into human reasoning, but in the economy of God, He loves for you to take from Him. Just like Martha and Mary. When Jesus came to Martha's house, Martha went into the kitchen, and she was busy preparing food. But Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Now, in the Asian custom, or the Middle Eastern custom, what Mary did was rude. And what Martha did was right, socially. But in God's, God's economy, he wanted Mary right where she was, drawing from him, hearing his word. And Martha came out, and she was stressed out, and she was grumpy, and she was angry, and... 
Lord, don't you care? My sister has left me alone to serve. She blamed two at one go. Don't you care, my sister? Blame the Lord and the sister. You know when you're under stress, you blame everybody but yourself. And Jesus looked at her and says, Martha, Martha, you are troubled and worried about many things. But one thing, say one thing. You know why Martha was troubled about many things? Because she didn't do the one thing that Mary did. No, you don't believe that. Many of you believe a few things are necessary, not only one thing. But Jesus says, one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Amen. Which sister made Jesus feel like God? Martha, who saw him in his natural tiredness, wanting to give to him, or Mary, who took and took and took from him. To an inexhaustible fullness that is still there beneath that veneer of tiredness. For he came not to be served, but to serve. When he was tired at the well in Sychar, a sinner woman came. The Bible tells us she came in the afternoon because she wanted to avoid all the lady folks, you know, and they're gossiping in the, in the morning. So she came in the afternoon when Jesus was there. And the Bible tells us the disciples have gone to buy some McDonald's. <laughs> and she took from Jesus and she went away. She took from Jesus and took from him and she went away. And this time she was no longer self-conscious, but Christ conscious telling to everyone in the city of Samaria, come see a man who told me everything about myself. Notice, she was delivered from self because she took from Jesus. When the disciples came back with their McDonald's, <laughs> want to give Jesus food, obviously they saw Jesus was reinvigorated. He looked different than when, he, when they left him. He looked charged up. He looked fresh. And they asked one another, has someone given him food? You see, with the Lord, when you take from him, you reinvigorate him. When you take from him, it's as if you make him stronger. David said it this way, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? You know how God feels appreciated? David gave us the answer. What shall I give back to God for all his benefits to me? I will take the cup of salvation. The answer, all right, is to take some more from God. Amen. God loves for you to take from Him. Take your healing. Take your provision. Take His goodness. Take, 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 take. Amen. And then you'll give and give and give. For unless you take, you have nothing to give. With men, horizontally, it's more blessed to give than to receive. With God, it's more blessed to receive. And He wants you to receive. Amen. You know, sometimes we come to Jesus for a sermon. We come to Jesus to have something to give some, to somebody else. We come to draw water instead of drinking. You can draw water and still die of thirst. But Jesus says, if you come to me and drink, drink is a personal consumption. Come to me and drink. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water for others. Amen. Let me bring this to a close. <laughs> Blessed are the short-winded, <laughs> for they shall be invited back. <laughs> so says a great man of God. My mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> you know, one time, they brought a woman caught in adultery and they just so rudely threw her right in front of Jesus while he was teaching in the temple. And they said, the Pharisees said, Master, we have caught this woman in the act of adultery. <laughs> now Moses, according to the law, says that such should be stoned. What sayest thou? Caught in the act, she was not probably clothed. Now, from what I understand about adultery, it takes two. Is it the same in Houston? 
I mean, in Singapore, it takes two. So where is the man? It was probably one of the Pharisees. <laughs> Master, this is what Moses says. What do you say? Now, if Jesus says, don't stone her, uh-uh, uh-uh, you're breaking Moses' law. If he had said, stone her, everyone around there would be wondering. They're confused because he preached about grace and love. So they thought either way they caught Jesus. He said nothing. You know what he did? He bent down. With his finger, he wrote on the ground. Now, what is that a picture of? By the way, the precincts of the temple is not earthen ground. It is cobbled stones. Look up here. We have a picture here. It's cobbled stones. So God is writing on stone. He's saying, you presume to talk to me about the law? I am the one who gave the law. Now, since you brought up the law, it's almost as if Jesus unleashed the full light of the law upon all of them by saying, he that is without sin among you Cast the first stone. Now, he didn't break the law. He upheld the law. But only one who is sinless can throw the first stone. And one by one, they drop their rocks. Jesus stooped down again, and the second time, he wrote on the ground. Now, God gave the Ten Commandments twice. God wrote on stone twice. The first time never made it to the bottom. Moses broke it all. <laughs> and God says, Mo, come back here. So he went up for another 40 days. And God gave him another two sets. Right? But this time, God said, put it under the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant. Mercy rejoices over judgment. That is the reason why the Bible says, when you fall from grace, notice, grace is higher than the law. Fall from grace. And the second time, he, after he said, those without sin cast the first stone, he knelt down and the second time again, he wrote on the ground by the symbolic action testifying he is the one who gave the law. Now, there was one who was sinless who could cast the stone that day. His name is Jesus. And you know something? When it comes to stoning that lady, that girl, the Pharisees would if they could, but they could not. Jesus, on the other hand, could, but he would not. Hallelujah! This is our God! This is our Savior! The Bible tells us one by one, they left, convicted by their own conscious, conscience. From the oldest, you know, that intrigues me, that the oldest one left first. I always thought when you grow older, you have less of a problem with your, with your sin consciousness. It gets worse when you get older. <laughs> so the oldest one left until the youngest, until there's no one left but Jesus and the girl. And Jesus went to her, she was probably crying, and Jesus says, woman, where are those that accuse you? And for the first time, she looked up with tear-filled eyes and says, no man, Lord. Then he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now listen, listen. The church has it backwards. The church says, go and sin no more first. Then we won't condemn you. But Jesus gave her the gift of no condemnation, which empowered her to go and sin no more. If we'll preach no condemnation, people will be empowered to go and sin no more. Hallelujah! What a savior! You know, I believe as that lady left, with all the burden of sin rolled away from her shoulders, Jesus smiled and says, Father, another one set to my account. 
which he will pay at the cross. Because you see, the reason why there is no condemnation for you and I today, wonderful as that truth is, is not because God has gone soft on sin. God is holy. He's thrice holy. He's a wonderful God, but he's a holy God. But every sin was born in the body of Jesus. And when he hung there on the cross, he took your sins and my sins, and God's holiness, holiness unleashed his fury and holy indignation and wrath against all lawlessness, against all sins, and stroke after stroke of the curse of lawlessness fell on Jesus. He exhausted all of God's judgment and cried, it is finished! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Now, oh, go on, help yourself. Give him praise. And now, the reason why there is present tense. Now, no condemnation for you and I, even when we sin. It's not because God has gone soft. It is because God's holiness cannot punish the same sin twice. The law of double jeopardy. When you sin, look to the cross and say, Lord, thank you, it's paid for. If you don't do that, something inside you, your DNA is very smart. When you condemn yourself, it seems like the cells of your body say, he wants to condemn himself, he wants to hurt himself. Let's create a disease. Doctors call it psychosomatic, autoimmune disorders when your body fights against itself. People are sick today not because of sin. Sin is taken care of. People are sick because of condemnation. Condemnation kills. So when you sin, what do you do? Look away from self to the cross and say, Father, thank you. There is my judgment. There is my beating. And all the cells in your body go, peace, boys, relax. The price is paid. It is finished. It is finished. Hallelujah. It is well. And you are on your way to wholeness, recovery, life, and health. What a savior. The dying teeth rejoice to see that fountain in his day. And there may I do vile as he wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, wash all my sins away, and then may I do vile as he wash all my sins away. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilt. All. Lose all. All the guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath. If you are blessed by this video, please feel free to comment on what spoke to you, hit the like button, or share this with a friend who needs encouragement. 
Don't forget to subscribe if you don't want to miss out on any of my latest videos. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon.